Hi church family, welcome to Bible study on Romans chapter 12, reading from verses 1 to 21. Uh, it's a continued Bible study. I felt like uh, last week in our Bible study we dealt more with the rest of the book of Romans and didn't really uh, dig much deeper into Romans 12, which I think is a very exciting and interesting chapter and a very important chapter in the book of Romans. So hopefully what we have to read and say is important for us today. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for the possibility of studying the Bible, even in this virtual way. We ask that you'd help us to hear what the words that we read, that they would speak to our hearts and help us to know what it is that you are saying to us today through these scriptures that are before us. Guide us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Romans chapter 12, and it begins with a beautiful um, beginning of Romans chapter 12 verse 1 which is I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds um, so last week in the broad sweep from chapters 1 through to 11, you kind of point to saying that uh, the I, I appeal to you therefore of Romans chapter 12 is in reference to everything that has come before. But that's not necessarily the case. So the interesting thing about the structure of the book of Romans is that we go up to chapter 8 and then suddenly jump into Paul's concern about the Jewish people. Uh, so he's been talking about how Jews and Gentiles both belong to the kingdom of God, but then he's gone on to talk about the law and how, how it can be differently understood. And then he has gone on in chapter 8 to speak about how the Spirit helps us in in all that we do. So there's... Um, especially uh, chapter 8, verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, verse 26. And so you can see that in, in chapter 8, he's been speaking about the Spirit, goes on to talk about how the Spirit works and and helps us, and then affirms God's love for us in Christ. So talking about um how through the death of Christ we know that we are loved and we belong to God and we also see that he intercedes for us and this is something he's been speaking about um, so not just that he intercedes for us but also further up in Romans chapter 8 about how the spirit groans inwardly within us and the spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words uh, verse 26 so there's all this um, talk about what the Spirit does and who the Spirit is and God's love for us made known in Christ and then jumps into um, this part about the election of Israel, helping his listener, his reader, to understand why Jews and Gentiles can belong to the kingdom of God together. But the argument of chapter 8 continues more fluidly into chapter 12, as if 9 to 11 should be in brackets uh, as a kind of aside. This is not what I was talking about, but let me just fill this in. That's what he's saying and, and tell you about the Jews and how they still belong and how God's plan isn't thwarted by what has happened in Christ, but this was his plan all along and you can all belong to the kingdom of God, to the family of God by faith. Um, so that's the aside, 9, 10, and 11. And then chapter 12, how are you, um, how you should then live in response and with the help of what's come in chapter 8. So the important um, verses from chapter 8 that the therefore I think refers to is chapter 8, verse 11, where Paul says that the, the spirit of him who raised... Christ from the dead lives in you. Let me. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. 
he who raised Christ from dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you this reminder that through the spirit he can give you power and give you new life this this reminder that even that that phenomenal and extraordinary power that that was made known in in Jesus resurrection is available to you and God is working in you and through you and just like I pointed out just now verse 26 the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep with wo- for words and God who searches the heart knows what is because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God and then that famous verse from 28 we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose and I wanted to remind us that sometimes we say oh well terrible things happen in Hampton, but remember Romans chapter 8 verse 28 all things work together for good and realize that Paul wasn't talking about um, dealing with suffering and, and inexplicable horrible things that happen but he was talking about the work of, of worship the work of becoming more Christ-like more spiritually um, liberated to be to be a worshiper of, of God and and so the spirit helps us in all of our weakness is able to take our weaknesses and turn them around and and bring them to something good in order to bring about our adoption into the family of God and uh, so that makes sense in the light of chapter 12 verse 1 that this spiritual which is um, this Greek word for spiritual is logikos. Uh, logikos is your spiritual act of worship. Is a reminder that we are not. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to turn on my verse numbers here. In the Greek, there's no verse numbers, and that makes life confusing. Oh, come on. Anyways, we'll just have to find our ways. Um, the, the word for the kind of um, spiritual worship is logikain latreian humon. This worship that is, could in one sense be translated as, as reasonable, but this word logikon um, relates very much to ideas of of the word of God and who God is and uh, one commentator suggested that a good translation um, for 12 verse 1 should be this worship is really God's spirit offering your worship for you this worship is really God's spirit offering your worship for you so in the light of chapter 8 chapter 12 verse 1 reminds us of worship that that um, that the Spirit does inside us, so to speak. And this fits with our understanding of the Trinity. The Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son. The Son glorifies the Spirit and the Father. And the Father glorifies the Spirit and the Son. They're always pointing towards each other. And when we invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives, and the Holy Spirit intercedes in us, then we become those who glory Father, glorify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we can't do that without the help of the Spirit who helps us to glorify Father and Son. It is all kind of confusing, but it, uh, uh, it um, helps me to understand the fact that we do not bring worship from ourselves, but the worship that we bring as people is through the Spirit, as as a gift from God, um, and because the Trinity is at work in us, it's not a kind of uh, selfish um, work, but rather one in which all three plus us participate, and we lift one another up. That's getting confusing, and so following from chapter eight and all that we read there. We know that we are being transformed through that power, the power of the Holy Spirit that that raised Jesus from the dead, into the people that we are called to be. And in so doing, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That we're not bringing offerings to the altar, but we are offering ourselves in service 
um, to work for God. And so uh, when we when we go to church on a Sunday, we are blessed to be able to bring our offerings, and we stand as we bring our offerings forward, and we offer our offerings, our money, and we dedicate that. But the reason that we stand is not because the money has gone forward, but because we acknowledge the fact that we're not just offering money, but we're offering our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, so that God could use us to to be a blessing into the world. And so verse 2 reminds us not to be conformed to this world, and the world that Paul was writing to was one where... Uh, physical sacrifices were come and you could sort of were brought and you could sort of buy buy God off in a, in a sense but to think differently and to be otherwise to be transformed by the renewing of your minds knowing what God wants what the will of God is and what is good acceptable and perfect these things are so important for us in our lives because we want to know how God wants us to behave and and we figure that if God loves us as much as is revealed in the life and person of Jesus then to know what his will is is the best possible outcome for our lives because it is good and acceptable and perfect and so we'd want to serve God with everything that we have in order to be the the kind of people that God would have us be. We want to serve God with our bodies, offered as a living sacrifice, so that God can use us in every which way that he can. So having spoken about offering ourselves, and I also just want to point to Eugene Peterson's beautiful message translation, paraphrase of, of the same passage. In the message, Peterson writes, Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. So this emphasis again on, on how the Holy Spirit's at work in us and helping us. This is not something we do in ourselves. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. So the first point is that God is helping you, that God is doing this. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Uh, so often we think, what can I give God? Well, all that you could give God is His sway in your life. Don't fit into the culture. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. And so Peterson is quite right to point out that we don't make the change. We surrender ourselves to God and allow God to make the change. And we don't want to be like the world, dragged down by, you know, it goes low. Instead, we want to invite God to bring out the best in us, to bring out well-formed maturity in you. So to expose the good and perfect will of God for our lives and in our lives. And that is so important for us to realize what God is doing in us and for us and through us so that we can be the people that we are called to be. Now he continues to write about how we are to, to live in this community of God and uh, as he continues, reminding us to be humble and to not regard ourselves higher than we ought to think. So verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Isn't that a, a beautiful reminder to us not to think too much of ourselves? And sometimes we do think too much of ourselves. And it often happens in the church that we have this um, problem of thinking that we're holier than others, or we're more spiritual, or I'm a proper Christian and the rest of the community is not. I'm the only true worshiper. You know, nobody else is, is alive in the spirit. You can have all of these false um, things 
imaginary imaginary statuses in your head but know that if you are thinking like that it's not the spirit that's speaking to you it's your uh, devilish imagination deceiving you we need to to find our purpose and in order to find our purpose we need to humble ourselves knowing that it is god who is at work in us helping us to 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 realize what we are meant to do but uh, not just that we are uh, on god we put our trust in god and in god's spirit in us not in ourselves or in others and so i, I, I deeply mistrust celebrity preachers or the phenomenon of celebrity type churches or mega churches because i think we're each meant to be um just dependent on god the holy spirit at work in our hearts not on all the uh all the fanciness that we could come up with and so i i as i was thinking about this i thought it's a bit like uh, we were balloons if we're all a bunch of balloons each one of us is the same we're made of the same material we're maybe even the same color the only thing that that makes us balloons is the fact that somebody has blown us up and so the breath of the spirit keeps us inflated and one balloon can't say to the other well i'm bigger than you i'm much better or, or they're only that size because they're full of air um, and it is only by grace that we are filled and so when you are impressed by somebody who's spiritual perhaps in church or you're impressed with yourself just remember that you're just a big balloon full of air and that air is a gift of god you didn't earn it you didn't uh, uh, gain it in some way you didn't get it because you're a prettier balloon than any of the other balloons it's just a gift of god's grace and that gift of god's grace helps us to become the people that we are meant to be Again, I, I love uh, Peterson's turn of phrase in verse 3. God brings the best out of you, develops, oh, sorry, I'm re reading behind, well for maturity in you. And then speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, acknowledging that God has, is the one who's, who's brought out Paul's gifts and Paul knows more than anybody else that it's only by grace that he is where he is and what he's doing and then reminding us that we live in pure grace and then don't misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to god you're not people who are bringing this goodness to god no says peterson god brings it all to you so we can't come to church on a Sunday and and, uh, and as much as we'd love to bring an offering to God, we can't. All we can do is make ourselves available to worship God, make ourselves open to the leading of the Spirit to, to help us to become the people that we are called to be. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are, and what we do for him i must say a danger of being a minister is that people often think that i've got some sort of special access route to god um, and the only um, thing i claim is maybe something that that makes me special is the fact that uh, maybe when i pray i i i should hopefully mindfully represent the the prayer of all the congregation so sometimes when there's something that that you can't tell everybody else and you tell me and i pray for you i imagine that i'm praying on behalf of the congregation and i and and i know that because the congregation prays for me maybe maybe my prayers are amplified a little bit but i'm just like that balloon and filled like all the other balloons and i think it's about um well for me being a minister is is about uh, god maybe giving me this job so that everybody would keep an eye on me and i'd learn to behave and keep on growing spiritually as i do need to grow 
Anyways, we put our trust in God and God's Spirit in us. We don't put our trust in people. Don't put your trust in me. Don't put your trust in the people you admire. They'll only let you down, but only in God. And we're only something because God has made us something. And the thing that would make us happy in life is to find God's will for our lives. That's uh, His good and acceptable and perfect will that we need in each of our lives. But we need to find that will in our lives and live it. And so in one body there are many members, and not all the members have the same function. Each of us has different calling, and we should celebrate that. But as we think about the body with many members, and not all of them having the same function, remember that maybe you've got a beautiful hand on the end of your arm, but if the arm is refusing to function, the hand is seldom going to be able to do what it needs to do. And as a church, as Paul writes to the Roman church and he writes to the church today, and whichever church you're part of, uh, whether it's the Methodist church or another one that you're just visiting us today because it's online and everybody's visiting everybody's churches, wherever you go to church, uh, resist the temptation to be to be a, a, a pew warmer um, or somebody who doesn't function in that community. But be part of the body, whether whether your part is just to be uh, an elbow or or a forearm or I don't know arm, but whatever you might be, um, you've got to be that, and you've got to be that with dedication, so that you fulfil your purpose, so that other parts of the body can fulfil their purposes. We who are many, and we say this in our communion, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. A reminder that we need each other to become the people that we are called to be. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Each of us has something to do. But the thing is, if all of us are, are, are trying to prophesy and we're all going around making a whole lot of noise and saying a whole lot of stuff and, and want to see if what we say is the right thing, um, nobody will ever hear anyone prophesy. And so the prophet will never never be able to exercise their gift. And sometimes we think that the prophet is the loudest person in the room. That's not necessarily true. It's normally the quiet somebody who's very timidly saying, I think God is saying this or that, and the rest of the community is so busy with the spectacular and the wonderful that we forget to notice that still small voice of prophecy that comes from a a quiet somebody in the back of the room who isn't very confident, but is feeling the nudge of the Spirit to say this or that, and and we're not listening well enough. Throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, God gives messages to people to carry into the community. Now let's not be distracted by the by the spectacular prophets who will tell you that they're prophesying about coronavirus and about the end of the world and, and all of that stuff. Um, if it's not stuff that's sort of making us uncomfortable and, and helping us to change the way we live in order to to follow Christ more closely, then maybe it's just spam mail. Maybe it's not actually... The real deal. Prophets will normally tell us to deal with the difficult stuff in our lives and we need to pay attention to that and listen with respect because because we're part of one body and by respecting each other we are able to, to get the body moving and doing what it ought to do. So the hands and the feet must listen to the eyes and if the hands and the feet don't listen to the eyes they'll end up burning themselves on the stove or tripping over the stairs or whatever it is. So the one who prophesies, prophesies in proportion to faith. And maybe faith is something that, uh, you know, Jesus says a mustard seed is something good to be, good to to have. Some people's faith is so confident and, and big that it seems a little dodgy. And so I imagine that maybe proportion to faith would say that we need to, to be honest in our prophesying and our speaking. Not necessarily saying, God said this, but rather saying, it seems to me 
that God might be nudging us in this direction. And then we find that God wants us to do something. Ministry in ministering. So that uh, word is also the word for, I think, if I remember rightly, deacon. Yeah, sure, that was a lucky guess. Uh, deacon in deaconing. So the minister and the deacon are the same thing, the servant of the church, the teacher in teaching. And sometimes I think we, we skip, we miss a lot of teachers. So to become a teacher, you need to do some learning. And I think there are lots of people who, who should be doing more learning and reading and, and growing in the understanding that they are, but also doing more teaching. So to help with Alpha courses and Sunday school and Bible study. And, and maybe you're called to be a preacher, to be a local preacher in the church. Each of us has these tasks to do. The exhorter in exhortation. So that's an, an encourager. The Greek word is the same as that for the Spirit um, when Jesus says, I'll send the comforter, paraklesis, to encouraging people to, uh, to, to get on through life, sort of tying yourself alongside somebody and sharing in their pain and their struggle and lifting them up. Perhaps a, an accountability partner in a Something like Alcoholics Anonymous would be would be a good comparison. Somebody who who ties themselves alongside you and encourages you as you go. The giver in generosity. See, there's room for the wealthy in the church too, but for those who 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 are called to give and who enjoy giving and and give wisely in a way that benefits the church and, and those who, who have genuine need um, to not just give like uh, begrudgingly but generously the leader in in diligence um, so you know I, I, I sometimes wonder if we really allow those who have that gift of, of diligent leadership to have enough room in the church because because um, we need them. And I know that someone like me, who's more a minister and a teacher, uh, I think I'm okay at leading. I do, I do that well. But we, I, as a leader in the church, as a minister, I need as many stewards and helpers as I can get. And I'm grateful for the diligence of those stewards in the work that they do. Because if they're not diligent, there's no ways I'd be able to do what I'm called to do. And I love this way, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Those who, who, who share in the struggles of others to do so cheerfully. We can sometimes begin resenting our ministries and the, the praying, praying or caring that we do um, by becoming maybe a little bit bitter and saying, oh, I'm always picking up all the struggle here, but, um, but, but let's rather be cheerful in being caring and compassionate. Cheerful, compassionless, compassion. And so then Paul goes on, having drawn this picture of a, a body of the church doing all of these things that it's meant to do. All, uh, all and everybody embracing their gift and using it to lift up the church. Um, and we must be careful not to, to neglect our gifts or our parts of the body in the church. Uh, all of these people working together become something quite different. And so this, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, where Paul also speaks about the gifts of the Spirit and and, and the ways that God works in us, he goes on from, from, from these gifts to, to the greatest gift. Let love be genuine. And uh, as we read this, we read it's about um, Philadelphus, that brotherly love. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So never think of yourself is better than others, but show honor to others. And we really need to do that. Um, pay attention to the people in our community and listen to them because we honor them as mothers and fathers, as brothers and sisters in the faith. 
Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And extend hospitality to strangers. All of these things are what we are meant to be. That's what the church is. A community of people who, who love one another genuinely, who love others genuinely, who show others honor uh, genuinely and, and in truth. In the NIV version, slightly different to the to the new revised standard version. Be devoted to one another. Not you know, not just just interested, not just uh, hi morning, how are you? It's good to see you at church this morning. But I th- I would think that if I was going to describe us as devoted to one another at this time while we're all separated, you should be looking for the people you haven't seen for a while and and uh, calling them out in the shopping center behind their masks or giving them a call if you've got their number. Devoted to one another in this brotherly love, like a family. And so this brotherly love phrase is meant to remind these people who are divided along Jew and Gentile that they are of family, and whether you're Jewish or Gentile, Roman, or wherever you come from, if you're in this church community, you truly are bound as brothers and sisters. And then be zealous, keeping your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. As we continue next week, I always I, I know that I've repeated a lot of what we said last week, but I just ran through these verses so quickly that I think it was important that we went back to them and prayerfully consider what it means to hear what they say to us in these scriptures. So I pray that we would be devoted to one another and that we'd honor one another and be zealous. And so um, if you can't see your church friends at the moment and we can't wait to see each other again I keep thinking how I miss everybody's face Um, keep praying for each other and keep loving each other and stay devoted to one another let's pray loving God we thank you that we can read these words from Paul to the Romans written thousands of years ago and still see how they are relevant to us today help us to be devoted to one another in our Christian community, across cultural lines, across opinion lines, across experiences in all of those things from church to church. Help us to be devoted to one another, to love each other genuinely and and caringly. Help us, Lord, not to think of ourselves as high, but to honor others above ourselves. And Lord, give us that passion that we need to be zealous for you, to have spiritual fervor in the way that we serve you, making us joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Go with us and be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.